A splash of blue floating in a sea of cold and darkness. Once, this was the center of the universe, and humans were alone. Now, science is convinced that others are out there, somewhere. Giant ears scan the heavens, searching for a needle in the cosmic haystack. But is the proof we seek right here, in our backyards? Millions of people over thousands of years say they've seen metallic disks in our skies. Thousands more claim close encounters with strange beings. Animals are bloodlessly harvested by seemingly invisible forces and for unknown reasons. Intricate agroglyphs appear mysteriously, the handiwork of unseen artists. And a solemn face stares at us from the surface of Mars, as if watching for a glimmer of comprehension, a possible sign that we might finally be ready for the next step. Science, the government, and the press insist there is no evidence of UFOs or an alien presence Yet people all over the planet seem to sense otherwise. It's as Aldous Huxley once wrote, facts do not cease to exist merely because they're ignored. In these programs, we intend to do what scientists and others won't do. Look at the evidence, the best evidence. Well, we just we just started making these things, and uh, this was an opportunity at this exposition to uh, show them. We thought it would fit in very nicely, and we thought uh, it fit in with the program. Science and journalism may not take UFOs seriously, but the subject gets plenty of respect from the world of commerce. UFO conventions are held somewhere almost weekly, from Los Angeles to Las Vegas to Eureka Springs, Arkansas, all over the world. And most come complete with flying saucer supermarkets, where assortments of outer space merchandise are for sale. We're going to be, we are raffling off this whole tape set, so if you fill that out. See, we have them with the pearls and everything else. T-shirts, hats, videos, bumper stickers and board games, motherships bedecked with magic crystals, glow-in-the-dark planets, alien masks and alien models, alien abduction protection kits. Creates a disturbance in the magnetic field. Alien Christmas cards, alien head pillows, alien hand puppets, and dissected alien children's toys. Bald, bug-eyed aliens are seemingly everywhere these days, in our movies and TV programs, in books and magazines, in comic strips, in advertising, American Express, don't leave your planet without it. Newspapers sell UFO fishing lures. Las Vegas casinos offer UFO bingo. More than money is at work here. In the face of persistent scorn and decades of official ridicule, interest in UFOs appears to be growing. Don Ecker is an editor for UFO magazine and also hosts a weekly coast-to-coast -coast radio show, UFOs Tonight. In the last 10 years, once again, there has been a reemergence of interest among the American public, and slowly but surely, various media outlets are taking, taking a closer look at what in fact is going on. UFO conventions aren't held for the sole purpose of selling baubles or booklets or space age religion. Most are sponsored by serious minded organizations like MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, which has thousands of members worldwide. Convention delegates typically share new findings or debate the veracity of UFO cases, theories, and witnesses. Our group is a scientific organization, and we have 75 consultants, all have doctorates in their own fields of expertise. There are over 40 of our consultants here at this symposium, and these are professional people, academics. But you wouldn't know that from reading or watching media reports. Many UFO gatherings permit a wide spectrum of persons to attend and to sell their wares or services. Everything from crystals to aura photos to fortune tellers. Subsequent media coverage of UFO conferences usually focuses on the oddball elements, whatever is most colorful. And the serious research gets left on the editing room floor. One of the attendees was a woman who says she's 400 years old 
and from the planet Venus. Another woman says she was instructed by her space alien brothers to undergo breast implant surgery. And a man selling tapes to Earth Vortex sites claims that the Trilateral Commission has signed a secret treaty to enslave the world. Sensational claims made by ubiquitous supermarket tabloids also make it tough for ufologists to be taken seriously by reporters. Few mainstream journalists want their work to be equated with the occasionally humorous but overtly ridiculous subject matter of the tabloids. Space aliens snatch bowler just as he completes a 300 game. Martians here to steal our frogs. Girl gives birth to 52 UFO babies. ET political hobnobbers meet with all manner of public figures. It's no accident that aliens and UFOs appear so often in the tabloids. The already popular Weekly World News confirms that its sales jump every time it has, quote, the alien on its cover. UFO stories in general are surefire stuff. For a reporter, trying to weed through the deluge of patently ridiculous material is a daunting task. It's far easier to poke fun at saucer nuts and ET masks, or stories about alien ice cream junkies. Every outrageous fantasy, every make-believe headline plays directly into the hands of those who don't want the subject taken seriously. Journalists apparently are leery of touching the subject. What they have been told for decades is the truth is there's nothing to it. There's nothing to the UFO phenomenon. Yet the preponderance of evidence is on the other side. Anyone who takes but one hour to review some of the available evidence cannot come away without the firm conviction that there is something out there. Blue moon, you saw me standing alone. UFOs are seen far more often than blue moons and by some of the most famous people of this century. More on that in a moment. Sheffield, England, 1962. Ramey Air Force Base, Puerto Rico, 1967. Brazil, 1978. California, 1990. The Hawaiian Islands, 1974. This drawing shows what witnesses reportedly saw flying over France in 1952. Nearly identical Saturn-like shapes have been captured by photographers the world over, off the coast of Brazil in 1958, again in Brazil during 1976, Thailand, 1973, Sicily, 1987, Japan, 1989. This famous photo was snapped by farmers in McMinnville, Oregon, 1950. Four years later, a military pilot in Europe photographed what seems to be its near double. This whirling burr-like craft was spotted over California in 1964. Twenty-five years later, Russian witnesses described the same craft. People all over the planet have seen remarkably similar objects. It was dark, there was three or four of us running along, and all of a sudden it was daylight. Just brighter and all get out, and yet you could see over yonder that it was dark. The same bright red color and didn't, wasn't blinking or nothing, it was just like a ball of light. What I saw were these balls of light traveling from the west to the east all the way across the sky. It was just a bright, White bright, light, bright yeah. light, yeah. And uh, it would uh, dim and get brighter and it would just stop and hover sometimes. Did you see that? You know, everybody's, did you see that? You know, and everybody saw it, but nobody had an explanation. And UFOs don't seem to know that they don't exist, nor do they seem to care. They keep popping up in apparent defiance of science and the media, which is the main reason public interest in the topic remains high, and why the public doesn't seem to buy the official explanations. Opinion polls consistently show that well over half of all Americans believe UFOs are real, possibly alien craft. In 1993, a non-scientific survey by USA Today revealed that an astounding 91% of its readers believe Earth has been visited by extraterrestrials. While there is no central collection point for all UFO data, much information is available today through computer hookups. 
John Komar runs an international computer network for MUFON and says he's received 15,000 communications in two and a half years. Input we get is worldwide. Information we get are from researchers, scientists, uh, astronomers. Uh, information that would take an individual years to obtain is at their fingertips. Komar, who has worked for a major airline the past 26 years, is one of an estimated 20 million Americans who say they've seen a UFO. Contrary to the stereotype of UFO witnesses as attention seekers or wackos, most witnesses are considered stable and are generally reluctant to discuss their sightings. Even government studies estimate only 2% of reported sightings come from people with mental problems. Still, unfounded perceptions about flying saucer sightings persist, discouraging some of the best witnesses from telling anyone about what they've seen. Uh, pilots are really reluctant to discuss any UFO sightings in public or to go public with it. But they see them. But they do see them, yes. A lot. Yes. Quite a lot. Quite a lot. Uh, one researcher <coughs> uh, estimates about 20,000 cases of pilots seeing UFOs during flights. The sighting that we saw was just right up over about that tallest tree there. Right. Taylor Blair of Memphis is one such pilot. He's been flying since he was 18 years old, everything from B-29s to small Cessnas. What he and eight other people saw zipping around over his backyard one night was unlike anything he had ever seen before. We saw four huge lights that uh, look like about the color of railroad flares and we estimated that the height was about 6,000 feet. My wife in the meantime had come into the telephone and called the uh, airport, called the approach control people and told them what we were seeing and they said well they had a radar fix on something and they had dispatched a helicopter, police helicopter out. And by the time she came back to tell us, the helicopter was over the backyard also, and apparently trying to climb, but uh, whatever it was, out climbed him and disappeared. Subsequent news articles suggested the object was a weather balloon, but Blair and the other witnesses, including other pilots, disagree, because they say the four lights merged into one and then zoomed off at an incredible speed. That would have been some weather balloon. You can't estimate a speed or anything that's no, traveling I can't. There. Pretty fast. Thousands of miles an hour? Faster than I ever traveled on an airplane, I'll say that. In addition to vast numbers of pilots, thousands of police officers have seen, chased, or been chased by UFOs. Veteran police officer Chuck Woodworth and five others saw a huge, brilliant UFO in central Nevada. And we stopped the car to look at it because the movement of this light was, was square. It, was, it wasn't a gradual fall or a gradual rise. It went straight up, straight down, and it made square corners. Uh, it's a good possibility it is something from somewhere else. Somewhere else. Woodworth says he passed on this information to military authorities, but to his knowledge, nothing was ever done. His sighting puts him in some rarefied company, not only with pilots and police officers, but also a president or two. Jimmy Carter once saw a UFO and even filed a formal statement. Ronald Reagan has had two UFO sightings. In one case, he ordered his pilot to try and follow the object. Britain's Prince Charles had a UFO sighting while flying home from a trip to the U.S. The Prince's countryman, 2001 author and science writer Arthur C. Clarke, says he has had six separate UFO encounters. Boxing great and devout Muslim, Muhammad Ali, has seen a UFO. Likewise for the king of rock and roll, Elvis Presley. Flamboyant guitarist Jimi Hendrix claimed that a UFO saved his life. Actor William Shatner met plenty of aliens on the Star Trek series, but also claims to have seen what he suspects was an extraterrestrial aircraft in real life. So did Ray Walston, the actor who played the title role in the TV series My Favorite Martian. The late John Lennon said he watched a UFO fly over Manhattan in the 70s. Farrah Fawcett, Ed Asner, Jill Ireland, Phoebe Snow, Sheila McRae, Meredith McRae, Stuart Whitman, Lee Majors, and Cliff Robertson are other entertainers who've reportedly seen flying saucers. Jackie Gleason told his friends and family that he had seen the preserved body of an alien, courtesy of his close friend, then-President Richard Nixon. 
it probably won't come as a surprise that Shirley MacLaine has seen UFOs or that singer Michael Jackson reportedly was interested in building a UFO landing pad. But other names may seem out of place in such company. British statesman Winston Churchill was so curious about UFOs that he ordered a formal study to be conducted. Dictator Joseph Stalin did the same in the Soviet Union in the late 1940s. Nazi leader Adolf Hitler was so enamored of UFOs that he ordered his engineers to design a flying saucer-like secret weapon. In the 1960s, future President Gerald Ford was one of the leading congressional voices in calling for hearings into UFOs. Also in the 60s, United Nations Secretary General U Thant said that only the ongoing Vietnam War was more important to the world than the mystery of UFOs. Astronauts, astronomers, physicists, military officers, inventors, people from every walk of life, every income level and education background, rural and urban, have seen UFOs. Kent Oram is a big city, highly successful political consultant who has run scores of successful campaigns, including those of Nevada's governor, lieutenant governor, and attorney general. Bradley Waddell is an assistant fire chief and part-time rancher in a small North Alabama town. Both had unforgettable sightings. And at the time, I made a joke to my wife, you know, I mean, if, if you were under the Starship Enterprise, you know, that's sort of what it might look like. Uh, and it was, I would say, it was gigantic, and it was more of a square shape, but it was a lot of lights. And so I had a pair of binoculars in the uh, back of my Ram Charger, so I went to get them. We finally found them, and then we looked up in the sky, and it was gone. I mean, just flat gone. Waddell says he and three other witnesses saw a brightly lit UFO land in a wooded area near his home. It was real huge, and it had a lot of lights on it. It had the red and the green lights and some white lights, and it was real round. And so we turned around to come back and go and sit there and watch it, and it was done gone. There wasn't no sound, no, no nothing. There wasn't no lights, no sound, no nothing. Just That's what it looked like with a flying saucer. An English scientist once wrote, it's the customary fate of new truths to begin as heresies and end as superstitions. To modern mainstream science, UFOs represent both heresy and superstition. In 1968, the late Dr. J. Allen Hynek testified before Congress that the legitimate study of UFOs is a scientific taboo. It simply isn't done. In Hynek's estimation, there had never been a fair and objective study of the UFO phenomenon at least none that had ever been released to the public, and little has changed since then. Modern scientists are all but certain that intelligent life exists elsewhere in the universe. The law of averages almost demands it. Billions of galaxies, each containing billions of stars, implies there could be untold numbers of other civilizations, societies far older than our own, with greater technological capabilities. Astronomer and pop science writer Dr. Carl Sagan estimates there could be as many as one million advanced civilizations in our galaxy alone. But Sagan is also one of the most vocal critics of the study of UFOs. He and others dismiss UFO sightings on the basis of probabilities and what we know of mankind's own technological limitations. In other words, they use theory to explain away data. UFOs can't exist, therefore they don't. Any scientist that takes the time to look at the data and the facts and the evidence accepts the fact that we have UFOs. You have to have an open mind if you simply make the statement that there's nothing to this thing and ignore it. The people like Carl Sagan, who's a brilliant astrophysicist, he's never bothered to read the UFO material. To him, there's nothing there, so don't bother me with the facts. One example is Dr. Sagan's 1993 foray into alleged alien abductions. Sagan is certainly qualified to speak about astronomy, but strayed far afield when, in an article for Parade magazine, he flatly dismissed all abduction reports as the result of hallucinations or other mental disturbances. Not only is Sagan lacking in psychiatric expertise, he's personally investigated only a handful of alleged abduction cases. Carl Sagan, uh has what I call the arrogance of ignorance. 
Uh, he is a person who uh, has enough arrogance to believe that he can answer the uh, UFO and abduction mystery uh, through lack of knowledge. He does not know much about the subject of UFOs. He certainly doesn't know anything about the subject of abductions other than what he's read in debunking books. Even though he had seven critics to the article before it was uh, published, absolutely uh, destroying his material, not just on a theoretical basis, but on a factual basis as well. And all of these letters to him before the article uh, was published were simply ignored. Dr. Sagan declined our request for an interview, but his disdain for ufology cuts a wide swath in science and influences the views held by other honest but uninformed academicians. If anyone would bring in some little green men and they would run around on my conference table, I would consider that convincing. See, but uh, absent that kind of physical evidence, I remain very skeptical. To the extent that there ever is any evidence or documentation to be looked at, it is looked at by scientists, astronomers, scientists of other types. Uh, it's that uh, in the vast majority of the cases, uh, there isn't anything to, st to study. Well, none of the scientists who talk about black holes have a piece of a black hole either. You might have noticed that. Uh, that's part of the problem with not dealing with the evidence. After all, we have 4,400 physical trace cases from 65 countries last time I checked. Now, when people tell you there's no evidence and then ignore the physical trace cases, I've had lab tests done on dirt that's been affected by the saucer compared to dirt that wasn't affected. There's some very concrete and definite differences. If intelligent life out there is found, that will be uh, the most important discovery in the history of mankind, period. Astronomer Doug Hall, like most of his colleagues, would give almost anything to be around when contact with other intelligent life is confirmed. He just doesn't think it's going to happen anytime soon and is certain there's not a speck of evidence related to UFOs. There, there is no evidence that we have been visited. The evidence just isn't there. How much study have you done on the topic? I mean, how much of the data have you looked at? Um, I myself, that's not my uh, actual field of expertise, but I've read uh, virtually all of the articles critically that have dealt with it. If Doug Hall were to read every scientific article about UFOs that has been published during the past 20 years, he wouldn't need five minutes. Simply put, there have been none. Scientific journals do not publish articles about UFOs or aliens or anything that even hints at such topics. Science has already made up its mind about these matters and no amount of new information is going to change this perception. There was a reception of 300 PhD astronomers in Victoria, British Columbia, and somebody announced that there was a UFO outside the building. Uh, not one astronomer went out to take a look. It's, it's too big a risk in their profession. If an astronomer, a PhD astronomer, actually saw a UFO, and I know secretly they want to, uh, and then if they reported that to an audience, they may be cut off from their grants, or they may risk the judgment of their peers. Dr. O'Leary has had personal experience with the wrath of mainstream science, but it didn't begin that way. He started on a path that is as mainstream as it gets. A Ph.D. in astronomy from Cal Berkeley, taught at Princeton and at Cornell with Carl Sagan, and was selected over thousands of other applicants by NASA for a manned mission to Mars. He too was skeptical about UFOs, but when O'Leary began to make serious inquiries into the topic, as well as into other so-called pseudo-sciences, he found himself a scientific outcast. People like Randy the Magician, uh, even Carl Sagan, who was a close colleague of mine when I was at Cornell, will uh, attempt to debunk and discredit. It's, it's very kind of knee-jerk emotional response, and it's not, uh, it's not befitting of a scientist, uh, because after all, science is supposed to be free and open inquiry into the unknown, and we scientists have tended to forget that. The grants may be the key. Of the $140 billion spent each year on research in the U.S., fully half comes from the federal government. It means that if the government doesn't want UFO research to be done, it simply won't be done. And if it is done, it won't get published anywhere that professionals like Doug Hall would be likely to read about it. Galileo's colleagues refused to look through his telescope because they, they didn't believe it could make things look bigger. And in the 17th century, the French Academy of Sciences uh, refused to believe meteorites existed because rocks can't fall out of the sky. 
And so I think that that's what's happening right now with the UFO phenomenon. The leading scientists have gone out of their way to attack ufology. You know, it's been kind of strange with the SETI stuff. You know, they turned on the instrumentation for that microwave searching device. They've gotten $100 million for 10 years worth of listening. And in almost all the articles about that, you'll find an attack on UFOs. What we're doing is science, but not that UFO junk. Science is supposed to represent the investigation of the unexplained, not the explanation of the uninvestigated. Today, mainstream science acts almost like a religion, rigid, unyielding, with its own special rules and rights and limitations. Anything which falls outside these rules of reality simply can't exist. Don't worry about the scientific community because science has become the religion of this period of time. It is not science any longer. It is theology. It is, the, it is what has replaced theology. This means the study of UFOs is largely left to well-meaning but sometimes untrained, underfinanced outsiders, such as UFO organizations. Many of these amateur investigators, like mainstream scientists, already have their minds made up about UFOs, and this only serves to further lessen the credibility of UFO research in the eyes of already hostile scientists. Most of this attitude seems to flow from the government, or more specifically, from the military, which has a long-standing, documentable interest in ridiculing UFOs and UFO researchers. If the government controls the research money, it controls the research, and it has repeatedly gone out of its way to make certain that UFO studies remain in the company of fairy tales and Dr. Seuss stories. The question is, why? Those who argue UFOs might be cultural byproducts induced by movies or books or advertising have difficulty explaining how the same phenomenon can be reported in virtually every culture and on every continent. For example, in the late 1980s, an estimated 10,000 Belgians reported seeing a triangular UFO the size of a football field over the period of several months. The Belgian Air Force tracked the UFOs on radar, initiated airborne chases, and launched a formal study. From 1983 until 1986, as many as 9,000 witnesses in the Hudson Valley region of New York and Connecticut reportedly saw a nearly identical flying triangle, along with huge aerial boomerangs. Several photos and videos of the objects were captured. In the southeastern U.S., the same huge triangular mystery craft has been seen by scores of longtime residents dating back to the 60s. We've seen planes and helicopters and stuff. See, like I say, that'd just be set still in light, and all of a sudden it just, pew, and then it'd be gone plumb out of sight. Next thing you know, it's gone. Well, just like it's eyes, and it looked like, well, it looked like it was just moving like that, sort of. It wasn't going that fast. The way it come over us, we thought we were about to decide to stop on us nearly. But it hadn't. And then when it was like thunder, it was gone. It's like poof. Yeah, but it, now we didn't see it speed up. We don't know what happened to it. We just didn't see it no more. It's gone. Now, reports of this same flying triangle are surfacing in Africa. Africa, Belgium, New York, Alabama. Four distinct cultures with different influences. Books and movies didn't make them all see the same thing in the sky. What's more, the late Dr. Alan Hynek in his book Night Siege asserts that at least 100 other communities have seen the same big triangle since the mid-1970s. It has been this way since the beginning of recorded history. UFO-like vehicles are found in ancient cave drawings. There are numerous references in the Bible, which could just as easily be attributed to aliens as to angels, including the prophet Ezekiel's encounter with a burning bronze wheel from the sky and its four otherworldly passengers. Ancient Egyptian, Chinese, and Mayans reported flying machines and odd beings very similar to modern UFO sightings. Australian Aborigines and indigenous American tribes tell similar tales of beings and craft from the sky. The Greeks and Romans called them flying shields or chariots. In the Middle Ages, Irish scribes wrote of demon airships and the strange beings who flew them. Wood carvings from 1500 Switzerland record unusual balls of light, seemingly controlled by some intelligence and hundreds of strange airships were reported in newspapers all across the U.S. during America's first great UFO wave, that in the 1890s, years before dirigibles or the Wright brothers' first flight. 
I would not exclude categorically that we had a high technological civilization on Earth. Why not? There is still the story of Atlantis and all these things. But even if we had a high technological uh, civilization in the past, this again does not exclude the extraterrestrials. Because anyhow, we have clear uh, writings, even with interviews, where mankind ask their teacher, where you came from? And the answer is, we came from the universe. UFOs have come in all sizes and shapes over the centuries. Cigars, discs, fireballs, footballs, barbells, boxes, diamonds, walnuts, and wash tubs. We can't say for sure how many sightings there have been, but it's likely that 90% of them are nothing to get excited about. Meteors, for example, are sometimes mistaken for UFOs, as this one was back in 1972. Some clouds look like UFOs. Atmospheric phenomena, including ball lightning, can also be mistaken for flying saucers. Weather balloons, too, and conventional aircraft. The most common UFO culprit is probably the planet Venus, along with other stars and planets, according to many astronomers. While it's true that 9 of 10 UFO sightings are probably mistakes, it's also true that 9 out of 10 are never reported at all. The main reason for that is fear of ridicule. Just a perfectly straight line, and it was going too fast for anything we've got. J.B. Langley has spent his entire life in the Appalachian Mountains. He and nearly every other member of his family have seen UFOs, which they called ghost lights, as far back as the 1930s. They haven't tried to get rich. They haven't asked for attention. In fact, the Langleys have been afraid to talk about what they've seen until now. Sort of like everybody knows everybody, and uh, you get to going around spreading rumors like that, they say, well, he's nuts. And pretty soon, why well, you wouldn't have anybody to talk to. <laughs> but you know what you see. And you know whether you're imagining it or not. You, and I know some of the stuff I've seen, I didn't imagine it. Langley's fears are well-founded. If you see a UFO, you must be unbalanced. At least that's a prevalent view, even for highly credible witnesses. In 1979, a decorated Tennessee police lieutenant, along with seven other officers and 12 other witnesses, watched two UFOs perform incredible maneuvers for several minutes. A psychologist later surmised that it was all in their heads, brought on by stress. Pilot John Lear, who has held every flight rating and whose father invented the Lear jet, says he was fired from a charter company after admitting his interest in UFOs. Airline veteran John Comar says such fears are not uncommon. I mean, would an airline actually fire someone who reported one of these things? Quite possibly. A more practical problem in getting people to report UFOs is that no one seems interested in taking such reports. UFO organizations will listen, but few people in official positions want to be bothered. Just try it sometime. Call your local airport control tower to report a UFO and see what happens. They simply don't want to hear it. Most police agencies will listen to UFO callers, but not because they want information on the sighting. Many times they keep the caller on the line long enough to determine if he or she might be unstable. And military authorities are adamant in their statements that they have no interest whatsoever in UFOs. Air Force spokesmen will tell the caller that they stopped taking UFO reports in 1969, a claim which, as we'll learn, is far from credible. Most people trace the beginning of the modern UFO era to an Idaho pilot and businessman named Kenneth Arnold, whose sighting of nine silvery UFOs in June 1947 spawned the term flying saucers and kicked off a nationwide UFO frenzy. What neither Arnold nor the rest of the world knew at the time was that the U.S. military was already conducting full-scale secret studies of the so-called saucers. After all, UFO sightings had been common in the final months of World War II. Foo Fighters, they were called. The Allies thought they were Nazi weapons. The Nazis, we learned later, thought they were ours. When the odd vehicles started popping up in the U.S. following the war, it became readily apparent that something was going on. Today, military officials laughingly insist that UFOs are largely imaginary, not a threat at all. But it was a far different story four decades ago, before the alleged cover-up was fully implemented. As early as 1948, top secret studies by the Army and FBI had concluded that whatever was flying around was real, metallic, 
capable of incredible maneuvers and of unknown origin. Subsequent studies by the Air Force concluded matter-of-factly that the craft were most likely extraterrestrial, but the public wasn't allowed to hear those conclusions. There was a, uh, uh, a report issued in 1949, a classified document then, stating that the uh, Air Force had by that point in time invest investigated some X number of sighting cases, X number of UFO cases. Eighty percent remained unexplained in 1949. Yet they were telling the public at that time, in public press releases dated the same month, that only 10% remained unexplained. Flat out lie to the press. Why did they do that? It is a question that is still being asked. Why? Whatever the answer, the Pentagon's approach to UFOs changed, encouraged by recommendations from the CIA, which urged that UFOs be stripped of their aura of mystery, lest some foreign enemy exploit them. From the early 50s on, military studies of UFOs were, in the view of many, little more than public relations exercises. Yes, there has been a clear-cut, solid, strong, I'll call it propaganda effort of disinformation right from the start. In the ensuing decades, hundreds of former military personnel have come forward to tell of their UFO experiences and of the evidence they viewed with their own eyes. We succeeded in getting uh, collecting information probably two or three times a week. And some of the cases, uh, of the contact cases, were quite spectacular. They were seen to descend and, and, and land on the ice. They were seen to take off from the ice and snow. They were seen to, de to land in, in the water up there, the open water, and descend underwater. Uh, others were seen coming out of water. They were traveling at such rates of speed, the sweep on the radar comes around every five seconds. The rate of speed was so great, we could not, it disappeared off the radar before we could get a, uh, so check the speed on them. How fast is that? Uh, well, it was well over 2,000, well over. And this is back in the 50s? This is back in the 50s, yeah. The next morning, the Alaskan Air Command issued a general order to all personnel and civilian personnel, all military and civilian personnel, a gag order, in essence, that what you thought you saw and heard on the previous day to this directive you did not see and you did not hear and it did not happen critics insist that a secret of this magnitude could never be kept and that even if it were the freedom of information act would allow access to all relevant government documents in reality this isn't much of a secret anymore too many people have testified about their personal involvement in ufo intelligence operations the question is, why have so few people paid attention to those stories? As for the Freedom of Information Act, it's been invaluable in forcing the release of thousands of UFO documents, but even its greatest supporters admit that the most sensitive information is still being withheld. Those documents which are released are often heavily censored. Many files are never released at all. The very existence of other records is falsely denied. We're dealing with the biggest story of the millennium certainly worthy of the attention of the news media, the historians and scientists and a lot of other people. Namely, that the planet is indeed being visited and that the best evidence has been kept secret successfully for 45 years. On New Year's Eve 1978, a TV crew flying between New Zealand and Australia captured some amazing if bumpy footage of a bright object which seemingly danced around the plane. Debunkers dismissed the footage, saying it showed, depending on the critic, a planet, a meteor, a plane, headlights, a lighthouse, moonlight on cabbage patches, and other unsupported excuses, even though radar operators confirmed it to be a solid, moving, airborne object. Similar footage and photos have been captured all over the world. Guatemala, 1976. Southern England, 1973. Italy, 1960. Belgium, 1977. It is abundantly clear from the photos and witnesses that the UFO phenomenon is not an American mystery, it's a worldwide mystery. Saucers, discs, cigars, and fireballs have been seen in virtually every nation on the planet and have been studied by numerous governments. But like the USA, most governments are not very forthcoming about UFO information. 
British writer Tim Good, whose best-selling book, Above Top Secret, details UFO cases worldwide, is convinced there is cooperation between governments in maintaining a cover-up. Many governments haven't the faintest idea what's going on. They have no need to know, and they haven't been filled in on the full picture by any of the major world powers, in my opinion. So it's not a worldwide cover-up to that extent, but there is an interchange of information, an exchange of information on the UFO subject at a worldwide level, certainly, but at an above top secret level. You're certain of that? I'm absolutely certain of it, yes. Good's contention is supported by Robert Dean, a military intelligence officer assigned to NATO headquarters in Europe during the 60s. Dean says he personally read an extensive report on UFOs prepared for NATO allies. The conclusions were basically in four parts. One, that the human race and the planet Earth has been under a detailed survey of some kind by several, and this was the part that I found exciting, several high technology extraterrestrial civilizations for a long period of time. This research, this survey, this program, whatever it is, had been going on not only maybe for centuries, maybe for thousands of years. Documents obtained from U.S. government files make it clear that the American military has a long reach when it comes to UFOs. In May 1986, for example, the Brazilian Air Force encountered at least 20 UFOs in three distinct formations, so many UFOs that their radar scopes were saturated. This self-described close encounter was kept under wraps, with the official reports ending up in Washington. June 1980, Peruvian jets had two encounters with UFOs and fired on one object. The shots had no effect, and the UFOs outran the jets. Pentagon documents show the Department of Defense got the files from a source in the Peruvian Air Force. Bolivia, August 1979, an object from space, three times the size of a basketball, was found on a farm. Film of the object was quickly sent not to the Bolivian government, but to Washington. Finland, 1982, Belgium, 1990, Nepal, 1968, Ghana, 1987. All of these foreign UFO incidents somehow found their way into the files of American intelligence agencies, but few were reported publicly. Cooperation from friendly countries is one thing, but what about our enemies or former enemies? How do they handle the UFO matter? And is there any cooperation between them and us? Mother Russia is singing a new tune these days. The Berlin Wall has crumbled and the Iron Curtain has parted, allowing the Russian people to experiment with a free market economy and allowing the rest of us a glimpse into a world that was, by and large, sealed off from the outside for decades. Even the KGB has opened some of its files to Western researchers and journalists. But what do Russians know about UFOs? It was assumed by Western ufologists that the Soviets were experiencing the same type of UFO encounters as the rest of the world, but isolated incidents were all outsiders heard about. As tensions cooled and dialogue began between the East and the West, the UFO issue was publicly breached. In a 1989 issue of the magazine Soviet Military Review, Russian military leaders argued in favor of an ongoing exchange of UFO information with the West. In the view of the authors, without such an exchange, a UFO might one day accidentally trigger a nuclear exchange between the superpowers on the assumption that the UFO was an enemy missile. The article acknowledged that UFOs were tracked by the defense systems of the USSR and implied that the same must be true in the U.S. Shortly thereafter, Soviet President Mikhail Gorbachev, in response to repeated statements by then-President Ronald Reagan, told Western reporters that he agreed with Reagan. If the world were ever threatened by outside powers, our two nations would stand side by side in the defense of Earth. Reagan alluded to this potential threat in five separate public speeches, including an address to the United Nations. I've often wondered, what if all of us in the world discovered that we were threatened by an outer a power from outer space, from another planet? 
wouldn't we all of a sudden find that we didn't have any differences between us at all? We were all human beings, citizens of the world, and wouldn't we come together to fight that particular threat? In November 1989, Soviet attitudes on UFOs became abundantly clear. The official news agency, TASS, reported on the alleged landing of an alien ship in the city of Voronezh, a 10-hour train ride north of Moscow. According to TASS, tall aliens and a robot exited the spaceship, walked around a park, and then left. The story was reported in the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, and on Network News. None of these major media outlets had their own reporters on the scene, so most chose the approach they normally take with UFO stories. Earlier tonight, the CBS Evening News with Dan Rather included a report about the alleged alien landing at Voronish. Rather, Riley commented on the Soviet claims about 10-foot-tall aliens walking around a Russian park. The CBS newsman added, don't believe everything you read in TASS. Within days, the Voronezh story assumed almost surreal proportions. American headlines chortled about pinhead aliens. Follow-up stories claimed that the only witnesses to the landing were young children. And because the tall aliens described were different from the usual short, bug-eyed variety Americans hear about, it was smugly assumed the Russians must be wrong. So much superfluous information was added to media accounts that it took only a few days to generally discredit the entire event. Prominent astrophysicist Jacques Vallée was one of few Westerners to personally investigate the case by meeting with Russian sources forces firsthand. In Voronezh there were many cases, not just the case that made the newspapers, not just the case that was re reported by TASS with the, 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 the school students. The witnesses were not just kids, they were 18, 19 year old kids, very articulate and obviously they had seen something, there were physical traces there, but there were many other cases, there are over a thousand witnesses in all in the city of Voronezh. Voronezh is a large city, it's over a million people. Uh, what they showed me was, uh, you know, the film, the physical evidence, they told me about uh, cases in which, for example, an object hovered near a, a nuclear power plant in Voronezh and a beam from that object melted the asphalt there, and that's what they are st studying now. The story Americans read was much different from what the witnesses say happened at Voronezh. Inside the USSR, the incident helped unleash a long pent-up interest in the UFO topic, an interest that, by decree, had been dormant until Glasnost and Perestroika. Suddenly, Russians were flocking to newsstands to buy the same sort of UFO tabloids that Americans buy, filled with lurid, sensational stories about nasty aliens and their dubious intentions. At the same time, UFO organizations, including respected scientists and military officials, were free to openly discuss UFO cases and issues. But still, little was made public about what the Soviet government might know. In March 1993, our investigative team traveled to Moscow to meet with current and former government and military officials concerning UFO files. The journey was undertaken during a period of dramatic political and social upheaval in Russia, but few events could be as dramatic or as important as what was uncovered about UFOs and human knowledge of the alien presence. Russian physicist Nikolai Kapranov, a national security advisor to the Soviet parliament, spent months making the crucial contacts with sources who would not otherwise be available to Westerners and who almost certainly would never have been accessible to Western journalists. Kapranov had heard rumblings about UFO studies over the years, but he was far from being a believer, that is, until he started asking questions of people in high places. More and more I started to think that this is something for real. <laughs> And uh, there are facts, and I've seen some materials one can't, you know, just, just drop. What I learned about the UFO is that they're certainly for real, and uh, that the UFO is uh, one fragment of a very diverse and strong uh, phenomenon. Military people are looking at that very seriously. With Kapranov's assistance, our team succeeded in making contact with a previously hidden echelon of UFO researchers, dedicated scientists who had pursued their interest in alien visitors during the darkest days of communism, and whose findings have never before seen the light of day. A government biologist who analyzes soil samples from UFO landing sites. 
a Moscow professor who has secretly directed a discreet organization of high-level scientists and military personnel interested in UFOs, an author and physicist who began studying UFOs in the 50s and who became a non-person when he refused to quit talking and writing about the subject an engineer in the Russian SDI program who asserts the Soviet military long ago determined that UFOs were interplanetary and who says UFO data has been incorporated into Russian beam weapon research. And a shadowy man who currently heads the ongoing Ministry of Defense study of UFOs and aliens. This man is Boris Sokolov, a retired Russian colonel from a distinguished military family. In 1978, Sokolov was given what seemed like an unusual assignment. Orders were handed down from the Ministry of Defense to every unit in the vast Soviet military empire. Every UFO sighting was to be fully investigated. All of these reports were to be funneled to Sokolov's command for analysis. First, an order was given to those pilots to chase the UFO and to shoot it. There were uh, 40 episodes like this, like that. Hundreds of Sokolov's most intriguing cases were compiled into this thick volume. Although much of the data is still being evaluated, it appears the Russians accumulated a mammoth amount of information about UFOs. The assumption that these craft were from somewhere else, perhaps outer space, became a foregone conclusion. The importance of these revelations is difficult to overstate. In Russia, of all places, a country still experimenting with democracy, it is now permissible for former military men and government scientists to admit a long-standing involvement in clandestine UFO research. In America, the cradle of freedom, it's another story. The Pentagon, CIA, FBI, and other intelligence agencies deny any interest in UFOs, although their own files indicate otherwise. Mainstream science says UFOs can't be true, so they won't be studied. Big-time journalism won't touch this story with a 10-foot typewriter. None of this matters. UFOs refuse to go away, and no amount of official put-downs will change this. Regular people all over the world almost instinctively recognize that something is happening. We all share a common question. What is going on? I really would like to know. I really would. And I really would like everybody to know. Oh, I'd absolutely like to know what it was. I know, uh, just as sure as I'm sitting here, that there's, there's too much evidence here and out there. And hopefully at some point there will be outrage to the point where people will begin demanding of their elective representatives just what in the hell is going on. And we have enough information to go by where we don't even have to wait for the government to come forth with information or disinformation. We already have a lot of information in the public domain. So now it's incumbent on us scientists to get to work and see what, what we can figure out with this. If you're not concerned or interested in this, you're simply uninformed.